So, uh, my name is Jay Holbin. I am a director and producer in Los Angeles. Uh, I am also a former or recovering cinematographer. Uh, I am a member of the American Society of Cinematographers. I am the technical editor for American Cinematographer Magazine. And I'm here today to talk about virtual production, mostly from the director's perspective. Uh, but what I want to get into is some nerdy technical stuff, because that's what I do. I'm a nerdy technical guy. And I've noticed that a lot... Oh. Okay, okay, this is like a stunt chair. <laughs> this is fun. I'm going to take a ride on this thing. Uh, and I've noticed that a lot of directors are really not very strong when it comes to some of the technical aspects of this new technology. So I'm going to try to introduce some of this to you all and see how this goes. All right? Hey, that's me up there. Um, so I have... I had the opportunity, an extraordinary opportunity, to uh, be embedded with the production of The Mandalorian uh, in season one. And I spent four months uh, with this technology, specifically authoring a white paper for Lucasfilm and tracking the evolution of the pioneers of this technology. And I've had a chance to work with it quite a bit since. So um, the, a lot of what I'm gonna kind of talk about as examples in here comes from Mando. Uh, because those are the pictures that I had to throw in here. But here we go. The first thing that I want to talk about is what is a volume? This is a term that's thrown around a lot. You're going to hear it a thousand times or more here at the show. And it's not LED walls. What a volume is is an area of motion capture. So it's surrounded by motion capture devices which create a volume of space in which motion is captured. Now we can add to this green screen walls, or we can add to this a set, or we can add to it virtual production LED walls to create in-camera visual effects. And that's what really separates the term volume from the LED world and the LED stages that we're seeing is in-camera visual effects. And I want to kind of clarify that particular terminology. So, in this case, in the case of Mandalorian, they're using active infrared trackers to track motion. This is a system called OptiTrack, uh, but I'm going to talk about passive and active tracking systems uh, as I go along here. So there is additional hardware that is necessary to make this technology work. We don't just throw cameras in an LED wall in a space and make it work. We have to have a way to track the 3D space, specifically of the camera, so that the camera interacts with the virtual material in the LED wall. And that's going to be active or passive tracking. Uh, yeah. Or we can also track actors, or we can track props. Hey, buddy, how are you? Good to see you. Sorry. Uh, so I'm a familiar face standing in the crowd there. So this is active tracking. And this is a great example from Mandalorian. And what we're talking about here is this device that's sitting on top of the camera. This is a picture of it standalone. This is a picture of it on the camera. And what that is, is a device that goes on top of the camera that has five points of active infrared emitting tractors. And this particular Sputnik is designed so that those five points are all unique lengths and unique spaces so that the tracking cameras that surround the entire stage are looking at this Sputnik, is what they call it, and no matter what angle those cameras look at it, it's unique. If all of those lengths of those infrared trackers were exactly the same, then the cameras wouldn't know if it's on the left side or the right side or above it or below it. So it has to have a very unique shape to it so it's different every time the cameras look at it. But it does mean that you've got kind of this spider thing poking out of the top of the camera that you have to deal with. So this is that additional hardware that, you know, sometimes can be a little bit of a nuisance, but you kind of get used to it. The other system is a passive tracking system. This is an example from a company called Mosis. And what this uses is markers that are placed physically around the set, little stickers. In this case, all these are not lights in the ceiling, but these are all uh, reflective stickers that are placed there. And there's a camera put on the camera. That's what this little box is here. I get to run around on the stage here. And that looks at all of the positions of the stickers in order to be able to determine its position in 3D space. 
So again, we just have to have this additional hardware on the camera in order to track. So now we introduce LED walls, and this is really the exciting technology. Because once we take this volume and we surround it with imagery, active imagery, we can now put our individuals into a virtual space and get in-camera visual effects, which means I can now shoot to get my final composite on set with a virtual production environment. And that's where things really get exciting. It means that in the morning, we can be in Iceland. In the afternoon, we can be in Australia. We can be on the moon later on. And it's just at the switch of the environment behind us. And of course, the, the sets and props, which some I'm going to talk about as well. These w volume walls, and I see I used the term wrong, these in-camera visual effects walls can be just a flat panel. They can be a flat panel with corners. They can be a curved panel. They can include a ceiling and a floor. There's a lot of different options to create these in-camera visual effects. Um, it depends on the individual stages. If you guys get a chance to see the view stage here in Los Angeles, they've got a wonderful wrap and almost like a J shape to it, a beautiful large stage uh, with a ceiling that is also LED ceiling, but it's partially transparent so you can light through it, which is a really exciting kind of concept. One of the really important things to keep in mind, especially when you have reflective objects, in this case, our star Mando, Mando, but when you're dealing with cars or reflected products or a reflective set, is that the world off camera is just as important as the world on camera. When we're looking at the reflections in Mandalorian here, it's everything behind the camera which means that your virtual production team, your virtual art department, has to create an entire 360 degree world so that what's reflected and not on camera can be seen as reflection in the subject that you are uh, photographing. So that was one of the principal reasons why uh, Lucasfilm and um, the production of Mandalorian chose this technology was because they're basically dealing with a walking mirror ball and the way to deal with that, instead of having to composite locations and sets into this mirror reflection, they put it real world. And you're getting interactive lighting. But there is some uh, danger to that I'm going to talk about as I get further into this. So this is, I mean, this is a great example of how this world works. This is a 70-foot uh, wraparound LED wall with an LED ceiling. And you can see these two lights in the background. This is the opening to the stage, and these are panels that will move in and close that to become an almost complete 360-degree environment so that you get these interactive lights on the subject. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of minutes. So the next terminology that we got to learn here, and I, you probably didn't know you are going to school, but that's what happens when you get me and show up and somebody gives me a microphone, is we learn the word frustum. And frustum is the field of view of the camera. But generally, when we talk about field of view, and I'm a lens nerd, so I talk about this a lot. But field of view, generally, we talk about it at the plane of focus. So when we are focusing on a scene at the plane of focus, that's our field of view. But when we talk about frustum, that is the field of view all the way to the LED wall. And this becomes incredibly important because, oh, these walls, when we're talking about a 70-foot or bigger LED wall at 4K or more, take incredible computer processing power in order to create a real-time virtual 3D world that will interact with the camera. So because it takes so much power, the only place that we process a full, true resolution image is in the field of view of the camera, in that frustum box. Everything outside of the frustum becomes a low resolution uh, sampling of the world, really just for reflections and interactive light. So this can be a little disconcerting when you first walk onto a stage, because you see this internal box, and this is the field of view of the camera. So this is rendered full 4K, beautiful high resolution, and everything around it is in low resolution, and it can look a little strange. There's another aspect to this, that when we move the camera, 
that frustum has to track with that movement. So if our system has too much lag or too much delay or too much, um, uh, what's the other uh, word for that? It's gone, uh, I can't find it. Latency, thank you very much, we're now interactive. Uh, if it has too much latency, then as I pan, it takes a second for that frustum to catch up to me. One of the things that kind of helped Mandalorian that had a 12 frame latency, which is a lot, was that the camera language of Star Wars is very deliberate and their movements are very deliberate. There was nothing that was aggressive. But if they had a scene where they had to throw a camera on somebody's shoulder and they were doing ser serious action, it wouldn't have worked. Now technology has improved and processors have improved and we can get some good interaction and good speed, but there's still that latency, thank you very much for helping me with that, uh, that we have to deal with in dealing with rendering the frustum. So, some of the cool things is that when we are prepping a project, the cool and not cool, is that so much more of our workflow happens in pre-production. And this is hard for some directors because we have to determine exactly what the set is gonna look like, exactly what we're going to see, sometimes months in advance before we actually get to shooting. So for directors who are used to showing up on location and saying, okay, you know what, I wanna shoot over here, and let's move that table over here, and uh, let's get some rocks here, you can't really do that. Because all of this environment has to be created ahead of time, rendered and you know, created in the Unreal world or in other uh, game engine, and so these decisions have to be made ahead of time. These decisions like what time of day are we shooting this scene sometimes has to be decided months ahead of time in order to prep the individual virtual loads. One of the great tools of prep that I got a chance to uh, be uh, experience on the ASC's STEM2 project, the standard evaluation material, was TechViz. And for a director, this was super fascinating for me. Because we know what previs is, right? Everybody has dealt with or has a concept of previs where we are conceptualizing shots and what that final shot's going to look like potentially in an automatic or in 3D or in full rendered imagery. But techviz is looking at the technical aspects of the entire set. So when I'm looking at TechViz, I'm looking at renderings of where my physical structure is, where my actors are going to be, where the camera's going to be, where the walls of the stage are, so that I could look at this and say, okay, I'm going to bring in a techno crane, and I want to swing... Oh, I can't do that, because oh, there's a, there's a beam here. Okay, I can't do that. So we're going to move it here, and we're going to move the virtual set instead, and i got to change my blocking, and I can plan all of this out in TechViz ahead of time and solve so many problems. This is a really dangerous chair. I'm gonna end up on my bum and you can all laugh at it when it happens. So this is an exciting aspect of the prep now of virtual production. Some of the things that we have to decide in early on are our sky domes and this is exciting because we can take a virtual 3D sampling of sky in any color I want, in any texture, in any clouds and I can make that my world. And the Sky Dome generally is interactive on set. So I can say, okay, I'm shooting this scene. You know what? I don't like those clouds. Let's rotate this dome around. Oh, that's pretty. I like that. Looks like a little bunny in the cloud there. That's where we're going to shoot. And I get that interactivity while I'm actually on set. We have 3D locations, of course, and those 3D locations interact with our camera so that as we move the camera, the parallax position changes so that it feels like we're in that world. There's a lot of versatility to this. I can change locations uh, very quickly. Um, and of course, uh, there are some elements that work and don't work. These are some great examples of interactivity. We can also put tracking on actors and on props and on elements of the set. So in this case, it's a little hard to tell from this picture, but this actress has a flashlight in her hands. The flashlight is tracked with motion tracking and interacts with the 3D elements on the wall. So as the actor swings that flashlight across the LED wall, you see a virtual beam of light going through the virtual set. And that's like really kind of cool. In this, uh, ILM was experimenting with giving the actor control in the spaceship. So he's in the cockpit of his ship and they put the motion tracking on 
the joystick, the control of the ship, so that as he moves, the virtual world interacts with him. So if he wants to go here, the world goes here. If he goes here, the world goes here. And it moves so the actor actually has control over what's happening in the environment behind him interacting. And that's pretty exciting as well. This is a really simplified case that we did on the STEM2 project. We have a, just a 2D video plate behind the car playing a clean plate of driving. And then we put that 2D plate on a monitor in front of the actors so that they can see the road and, and react exactly with that environment. And as they're turning, we see the road turn, then we see it turn behind them. And that was really amazing for the actors. Instead of just being on a green screen stage and seeing nothing, they can feel like they're actually driving. Oh my god, here comes a bush, and interact with it. And that was pretty cool. So we have to have practical elements as well. We have to have set that we're putting in here. Anything that the actors interact with has to be real and hardcore. Oh, hey, what's going on? Uh, so in this case, the doorway is real and is practical, but the environment behind him is not. So any doorway that we have that the talent goes through has to be practical because we can't walk through an LED wall that's going to hurt. We're going to send actors to the hospital. Um, but we have to introduce any props that they are interacting with practically. There's a problem, and it's, there's some solutions for it, but if we introduce a second camera, because that frustrum is generated through the computer, having a second field of view can be really, really difficult for the system to render. There are a couple of solutions to this. One is to put them at different refresh frequencies so that one camera has one sync and another camera has another sync, but that can be really, really disconcerting for your crew and your talent because looking at the screen can almost be nauseating to see these two sort of flickering images happening. So it's a problem that we're still trying to solve, and in most cases when we introduce a second camera virtually, we're putting it, the background so far out of focus and away from the rendered frustum, and that's kind of how we solve that issue. We're doing you know, super tight close-ups or inserts or something of that nature. Two cameras is still kind of a tough deal. Movement of the camera I already talked about. Moray is an issue. That is an interference pattern, sort of a dancing pattern that is created from an interference of the pattern of these LED walls to the pattern of a digital camera sensor. And so we have to have a, be a certain distance away from, with the camera from the wall and generally are putting it out of focus. So shallow depth of field plays very well in a virtual production environment. If you're somebody who wants really deep depth of field, you want that Citizen Kane look, this is going to be a very difficult technology for you to work with. Lighting from LED walls, this is, this is kind of where Mando sold the wrong message to the industry because they sold the idea of we're lighting completely with this LED wall. We don't really need other lighting. That's not necessarily true at all. But unfortunately, the, the color fidelity out of these LED panels is not as good as the color fidelity of our professional motion picture lighting equipment. So we, if we're lighting purely with these LED panels and we're lighting humans, we can get skewed skin tones and we can get bad colors. And if you're doing commercial photography and you're lighting products, you can get in trouble because you're not rendering that product in the right color if you're using the LED panels. That's why we're incorporating concepts of uh, image-based lighting utilizing professional motion picture lighting tools that are able to pixel map the imagery from the virtual world onto the lighting tools uh, and light with those instead. You can have some interactivity with light from the LED walls, but you need to be careful with it. Uh, okay, external lighting, there we go. One of the problems with the external lighting that kind of was frustrating to me is I am now beholden to the position of that physical LED wall with where I'm lighting. I can't put a light directly in, in front of my actor because if it hits the wall, then it's going to wash out the wall. So there's some limitations as to how I can light based on that LED wall being back there because I can't let any of my external light hit the walls or the whole gig is up. But there are incredible benefits to actors. It puts the actor not on a, a green screen void or in a blue screen void, it puts them in the environment and 
every actor that I've ever worked with with these LEDs in environments is so grateful for it and feels like it just really helps them to get into that space, which is an incredible, powerful tool. Uh, so how do we incorporate LED walls? Well, set extension is one way of doing it. We have a little bit of practical world and then we increase that world in the background. One of the incredible, powerful things for it for directors and cinematographers is the fact that we can freeze time. So there's no longer the aspect of, we want to get this sunset, we got five minutes to get this sunset, everybody's got to be here, got to be ready right now, let's do it, no, 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 come on, come on, let's roll. We can freeze that sunset for 12 hours, for two weeks, for whatever we need, and have the perfect moment for as long as it takes to capture that scene. And that's what uh, Matt Reeves and Greg Frazier did here with Batman, was to have this frozen uh, sunlight moment and to be able to get that exact light that they want. Uh, set extension is an amazing uh, tool. So again, on Mando, uh, these rocks here and here are practical. The floor and the mud is practical, but everything around it here is virtual. So we have a couple of elements that are near the talent that we can have that are practical to extend the world and the rest of it is virtual. This in this image looks silly, but on set was an incredibly believable uh, visual experience, which is this is a practical set that's built, and this is the virtual extension of it. And in camera, it's seamless. And it's perfectly parallax tracked so that as we move around the space, we, I wasn't shooting this, I was only there, but as they move around the spaceship, the perspective changes perfectly and it matches so that they only have to build a portion of the set and all the rest of it is tracked with it. Uh, I talked about the lighting and the color fidelity uh, of LED walls already, and this is an issue and it was a big surprise. Let's imagine that we are shooting a scene out in the desert. We have beautiful red sand, right? So we send out a team to capture that environment photographically, or photogrammetry. We put it in the background in our virtual world and we have this beautiful, incredible red sand desert. And then our production designer comes in and throws red sand down on the stage to have the practical elements. It's exactly the sand from out on the desert. We brought it in in a truck so it matches perfectly, except in the real world, all of that sand everywhere is lit with the sun. It's lit with one source. But on the stage, when that sand gets close to the LED wall, it's now lit by the color of the red sand on the wall and that biases the color of the red sand on the practical set. So now it doesn't look right and it doesn't match right. So there's a couple of techniques. Uh, there are some uh, production designers who are experimenting with desaturating color of practical elements as it gets closer to the wall. Sometimes if we put a little lip on that floor so that it's not actually lit by the LED walls but it's lit by everything else, that can match. But it is something you have to be careful with. LED panels are incredibly reflective to sound. It's a wall. So if you have a certain configuration of an LED stage, it can be a perfect echo chamber. And man, that is difficult for sound uh, mixers and actors. It can be really disconcerting. So it's something when you scout a location and you're checking out that LED stage, check that sound and see if it's going to be an issue with you. I did this and it... There we go. Uh, you stand in the middle of that and you kind of snap and see how much echo you're going to have and then talk to your sound mixer about how they're going to deal with that. And then this is not the end all be all technology. It's exciting technology. There's incredible power to it, but it does not solve every problem. It is not the solution to every production. It is expensive. This is not necessarily for uh, low budget filmmaking. This is not the solution to you know, every issue that you have. But in some cases, this is a very, very powerful technology that is evolving very, very quickly. As you can see all around the show floor here, there's a lot of technology and a lot of uh, LED tech that's happening here. Whew, I think I actually made it in time. This is how you can follow me and stay in touch with me. This is my sales pitch. You can follow me on Instagram. You can ask any questions. I am always happy to answer. Um, and at that point, I will open this up if anybody has any questions. And I think uh, Rachel there has a microphone. Okay, don't everybody speak at once. That gets really awkward. 
are the slides available? Um, the, can we make the slides available? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so talk to this lovely lady yeah, here. Can you email afterwards and we'll get that over to you. Great. Okay, again, not everybody all at once. Hey, Jay. Hey. Oh, hey. Hey. What's, What's up? up? While you're watching TV now, any movies, any shows, are you really able to notice when it's virtual production? What is the scale there? Yes. <laughs> what um, gives it away? <laughs> it really depends on, on how... <laughs> Oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. Let, let me answer this one carefully. You were uh, tricky. Um, yes, sometimes. Uh, and, and one of the biggest telltales for me is contrast. So uh, a cinematographer will sometimes make the background uh, less contrast to simulate more depth. But that can also very quickly, to a trained eye, uh, get rid of the illusion. And it, it feels like it's pasted on. Um, that's it's kind of the biggest thing that's a giveaway, even on some of the biggest shows uh, that are utilizing this technology right now, where uh, I'll feel it. Uh, I'll look at it and go, <laughs> okay, that didn't work. Um, Greg Frazier, who did the first season of Mandalorian and really kind of pioneered this, ha really talks about the honesty of lighting and the honesty of the image and in believing that particular image. And uh, I think that that is absolutely the ground level that we all should achieve or you know try to achieve is when I look at this picture do I believe it do it just feel it does it feel truthful even though it's all fake um, and yeah some are not working so well oh god it's gonna get me in trouble hey right here Jay hey, I had a question up? so that you talked a little bit about like in the when you're doing two camera and instead of doing multi them, you can cheat a little bit, shoot it tighter, yeah. get it a little out of focus. How are you seeing some of those workflows evolve where we say, hey, uh, this I'm gonna do fully in the engine, this one I'm gonna do plates, this one I'm gonna do in two and a half D. How do you see these methods now that people have time to play with it, uh, kind of blend? It's all in evolution. And all of that was stuff that I kind of wanted to talk about, but I didn't <laughs> have the time in here. Uh, things like, when do we do a virtual entire 3D environment? Or when do we just do 2D plates? Like the car process that we were doing, the, the very expensive poor man's process, uh, is just video plates that are rendered into the Unreal Engine. And there's no parallax, because we don't ever have to really deal with it, even for a little amount that we're moving camera. So I don't have to render an entire 3D world. We shot those plates and then just put them on the screen. Really, it's about the interactivity of that world. If I have to move and get my parallax difference, then that's when I need that 3D world. Um, I haven't seen anybody yet on a single screen combine 3D, 2.5D, and 2D but I suppose it's possible. You might be able to answer that better if that technology is even available right now. It might be smart to be able to have 3D uh, Unreal content, a 2D window in window for a second camera as just a fixed background. Um, but I haven't seen it yet. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Anybody else? No. Oh, hello. Now you're warming up. Hi. Um, in many ways, this is just... Uh an extension of technology that's 100 years old, rear projection, it started. So we're, we're going we're down a path that has been already somewhat discovered and t using new technology to solve uh, problems. Um, and the current um, fascination is with LED screens. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on alternative approaches, including short throw lasers and rear, rear projection or and front projection um, um, theatrical uh, projectors versus versus like 2,000 video LED modules? I have no experience with um, sort of the modern iteration of front projection, which is I think what you're talking about. Um, and there are, there are things that that required. And the same thing with rear projection. So there are limitations with rear projection. We have to match the entrance pupil of, of the projector and the camera. It's a fixed perspective. There's very little movement that we can do with that. So this is a great evolution of it. But you're absolutely right. And it's the first thing that George Lucas said when he walked onto the Mandalorian set for the first time. He said, ah, yeah, we've been doing this a long time. This is rear projection. 
like, okay, you just simplified, you know, multi-million dollar technology, but it's exactly what it is. Front projection required a, a retro-reflective screen that when you're putting the light onto your talent, it's very, very low, but it's reflecting back off that screen at a high reflectivity. And we would have to reintroduce that sort of 3M material in order to do that. I don't know anybody who's doing it. It's possible. Um, it's sort of an extension of what Claudio Miranda did on Oblivion, which is a, a white psych stage and multiple video projectors that were projecting the clouds and not that was all above the talent and all above the set, which is a very similar kind of concept and was incredibly effective. Also got great interactive lighting from that because you're reflecting the true value of that projected image back in a P3 color space or a Rec. 7 on color space, whatever they, they chose there.